After all these years, I finally went and played Rise of the Grave Robber for the first time. My zeal for Tomb Raider had taken a long hiatus since completing the 2013 release, but this holiday season of 2022, or I guess the last holiday season, I decided to rejoin the old girl for some more treasure finding, tomb demolishing, manslaying adventures, and had some choice thoughts to share. <sighs> Sometimes I really can't stand this woman. She. She always tells me she can make this jump. I can make this jump. But then, when the time comes, she just flails her arms as she wails to the ground and breaks her legs. So I swear, the next time she tells me that she's not strong enough, not strong enough, I'll fling her off the nearest fucking cliffside. Since her last adventure where she caught wind of some dangerous organization called Trinity, Lara's now being stalked by them as she tries to work out remnants of her late father's manic obsession with some life-giving artifact or whatever. I don't give a damn about my reputation! As you can expect, the dangerous organization are the bad guys this time, and they're after the same thing Lara is, as usual. And Lara's after it cause her dad was after it. I mean, she says it's because it'll be a great investment for humanity and stuff, but like, well, who is she kidding? Her first ex expedition takes her to a tomb in Syria where she finds the resting place of an infamous prophet who was supposedly closely tied to the artifact. Except shock and horror, the prophet's resting place is missing the prophet. But Lara can't ponder that since Trinity crashes the tomb and tries to get info out of her. Luckily, Lara's maxed out her thief skills and manages to blow up the tomb and flood it, allowing her to escape. She then returns to Croft Manor, a place that's clearly seen better days. She had earlier told her dad's old girlfriend that she couldn't go back to the manor, but here she is. Maybe because she realized her apartment wasn't exactly a safe space. Now let's take a detour into Lara's personal life, shall we? Turns out, she's been having a bit of a property dispute with her uncle about the ownership of the manor. Since her father's passing, she hadn't found any documentation stating that the manor would go to her, and her mother's asshole brother was trying to pull a fast one with her parents' property, since he never liked Lara's dad, or the Croft name in general. Since your mother disappeared, her death was never technically declared. It's no surprise that he never drafted a formal last will and testament to account for this circumstance. Unfortunately, you have no legal claims to the estate. What? We get a somewhat cute but also nauseatingly aristocratic love story on Lara's parents, highlighting various different positives and negatives to both of their characters. Essentially big posh nerds, in a rather Romeo and Juliet-esque situation, ultimately culminating in Amelia freezing to death after her plane crashed into bed where she was supposed to meet Richard, where he was eagerly harassing monks to reveal their supposed secrets to immortality to him. He even tried to get the monks to resurrect her, but no dice. Sorry, Richard. Fools! Lara's uncle was not pleased with this. I hope every moment of your life from this day forward is a ringing echo of loss. You stole Amelia from us. But Winston told him to go kick rocks. We love Winston. Old Dickie Croft then spiraled further into his work, locking up his late wife's entire wing of the house and being somewhat of a distant dad until he perishes later as well. Luckily for Lara, she does a little tomb raiding in her own home and not only finds her ownership to the property, but also the undisclosed resting place of her own mother. Well, I guess that sells that on glass wipe. For the record, I'd just like to say, this was all very irresponsible of Richard. All this trouble just because Amelia was never claimed to be actually dead. Meanwhile, he stored her body in his house, never proclaimed her dead, just so he could go on this wild goose chase in hopefully bringing her back to life one day. You insane bastard. Joanna pays her a visit at the house. Lara's huffing and puffing after doing literally nothing but sitting on her laptop and spouts off again about but he's like um you really shouldn't risk your life for this stuff lara so he's upset and he leaves and she's upset and throws things some dude breaks in and steals her research thanks to him lara now feels obligated to at least stop trinity and jonah can at least get behind the idea of stopping an insane cult from obtaining world altering power so they go to siberia and after enduring what must be the sun queen's revenge lara's left alone separated from jonah who really isn't paid enough for this BS. I'd follow you almost anywhere, but that place has a bad energy. And Jonah really should count his blessings, cause it's nothing but slaughter, bloodshed, and falling off of stuff from here on out. Lara encounters some natives who happen to be beefing with the bad guys, and lucky for them, they don't decide to attack her, cause for those who aren't aware, 
Lara is an insane mass murderer. I'm coming for you all! In true Tomb Raider fashion, Lara gets herself <coughs> captured and disarmed by the enemy. This is like the sixth time now? I'm losing count. She learns that her dad's old girlfriend, Anna, was a treacherous b and her and her brother are working with the bad guy organization to get the artifact so that she doesn't die of whatever terminal illness she has. This might have been more understandable if they weren't insane culty weirdos. So Lara escapes immediately, a great personality trait that I'm glad hasn't changed since the reboot, and while doing so she comes across this seemingly wise and oddly attractive native dude who points out that he can help. Surely he can't be too important. After the typical clumsy reboot Lara stumbling, she meets up with the natives at their village and helps them repel a poorly timed attack from the bad guys. Poorly timed cause Lara is here. <laughs> Our dear madwoman continues her quest for the immortality artifact against the wishes of the attractive man. And after further desecrating yet another tomb, she doesn't find the artifact, but she does learn that there's a map out there that could lead her to it. So after yet more slaughter and platforming, we snag the map and read it using a rather impressive light show mechanism made by the native ancestors. Also suddenly Jonah shows up. Miraculously, he wasn't shot by either the bad guys or the natives in trying to find Lara. Things are looking up for Lara. Except Trinity shows up and kidnaps Jonah. Is this really all they brought this man back for? We go get Jonah, who's really too pure for this world cause he can't even bring himself to kill the evil bad guy. He then gets stabbed as a result and would have been a goner if the attractive man didn't heal his wounds instantly. His name's Jacob by the way, I, I should probably mention that. Lara then finally realizes that attractive man is, in fact, the immortal prophet! Amazing, stunning, spectacular, would never have guessed. He lets her into a secret passageway leading to the ancient city where the artifact is held. The only problem is that it's guarded by a bunch of immortal dudes in armor. But hey, at least the scenery is nice. Since Trinity has also stolen the map to the artifact, it's now gonna be an all out war between Lara, Trinity, the natives, and the immortal dudes. Chaos ensues. The main bad guy tries to step to Lara, but he gets owned so fast that the game phased him out of existence in my first attempt at fighting him. He then reveals that Trinity killed Lara's father. Who oh my god. Oh, so oh, I, I never, ooh. And then we kill him. Lara's dad's girlfriend is trying to get away with the artifact, but she's cornered by Lara and the immortal dudes. So she just says, screw it, and looks into the light, making her essentially immortal. But then Lara abruptly figures out that hey, maybe immortal humans aren't such a great thing. So she smashes it to pieces, and so all the immortal dudes that should have been dead crumble like sandcastles, including the attractive prophet. Goodbye, Jacob, you will be remembered. By me, specifically. Lara won't remember you, trust me. We confront Anna about Lara's dad, and she says she had no part in killing him, meaning that Trinity would have done it themselves. Trinity, however, manages to snipe her before she can tell Lara anything more, but they leave Lara alive for some reason, probably because they're too lazy and incompetent to find the ancient treasures themselves. But joke's on them cause they still apparently don't know that Lara is an insane mass murderer. She and Jonah are then seen leaving the manor, presumably to find more people to slaughter. That's our Lara. The reboot series has seen the team at Crystal Dynamics try to infuse more story into the Tomb Raider series than there's ever been before. While they do a passable job, it's clearly not their strongest suit. It precedes a typical cinematic expedition of this type might. There's a couple attempted curveballs, but you can probably see those coming. Between previous games in the series and the movies, it's fairly standard, with the main story elements being Lara's motivation from her father, Anna's manipulations, Constantine's insane obsessions. Jacob's identity and history, and also trying to keep a friend out of harm's way. If there's one thing I'd have wanted an improvement on, it's the final conclusion. There could have been a bit more satisfying bookend to Lara's journey. Not necessarily by changing events, but by perhaps recontextualizing them or adding more significance to them. The reconvening with Anna before she eats lead was very short and could have had more kick to it. 
to emphasize more of Lara. I'd have preferred to get a scene back with the natives and Jonah before the credits rolled. Just some things to wrap it up in a more solid way beyond the two just getting on a plane. A lot of stories kind of gloss over endings and epilogues, but I feel like they can do a great deal for at least letting people walk away from a game with at least a positive feeling, even if the entire journey wasn't the best. I can't necessarily ask for the story itself to be more epic or emotional, cause when it comes to Tomb Raider, that isn't necessarily the vibe I'd want for the story. But what I can ask for more of is intrigue and mystery that's not so transparent. They tried with the identity of the Sun Queen and the identity of the Prophet in this game, but they could do more. Honorable mention to the Croft Manor DLC. It's nothing groundbreaking, but it was very nice to see more of Lara's history exposited in an amount of detail that's honestly never been had before. As an example, the DLC actually gives you reason to be endeared to Winston without even meeting him. Leave it to Lara to lock such a nice man in the freezer. The whole parent thing, it started in the movie with Angelina Jolie. Cause it was a movie, I'll give them credit. I understand the need for them to put that in the format of the Legend Trilogy, just to capitalize on it. But the Legend Trilogy was their second chance to do that plotline. And they did that plotline, where it actually went from start to finish pretty well. And for some reason they're trying to do it in the reboot, despite being a different Lara, despite being a different storyline. Father, you were right. He was right. There's so much more you can do. I don't know why you have to attach Lara's history and her story to her dad and her mom again, reviving the dead yet again. Constantine's nuts being consumed by the ironic evil of his faith in himself and Trinity's perception of God. Then blood it shall be. Contributing to this are the manipulations of his treacherous sister, who basically admits that she deceived him in their youth to put him on this path. She manipulated Lara's family to help her corrupt employers, but she does seem to at least have some fondness for the Crofts, but it's not enough in the long run. Jacob immediately came across as humble measured man and as we have speaking didn't do much to hide his identity for long. But in general, there's nothing really interesting about who he is, despite his status as a surprisingly well-adjusted immortal man. Jonah's Jonah, just about filling the damsel in the stress quota that Sam did previously. None of these characters are negative, they're just not pushing the story up in quality. If anything, the weight of these stories would always fall onto the protagonist and the antagonist. While the previous games in the franchise weren't that story focused, it could be said that they had stronger characters on the antagonist side. While some were a little out there, they stayed in our memory. They had distinct personalities and their own clear strengths as to how they could get under Lara's skin. Or straight up beat her down. The antagonists this time aren't doing too much for me, which could be a symptom of the added seriousness and realism of it all. Meaning, the character's significance this time is all riding on Little Bird. Gorgeous, amazing, stunning, 10 out of 10 would go again. Well, maybe not here though, and maybe not here either. Tomb Raider has always had great scenery, and the natural landscapes are probably one of the bigger reasons I've always enjoyed the series. It was always just nice as a kid to get whisked away to a foreign land on a random adventure, to places you'd never go, but could somewhat feel like you've been somewhere familiar. If I wanted to go to a beach, Lara could take me. If I wanted a snow day in July, Lara would take me. As a major contrast to the previous game, Rise takes place in Syria and Siberia, having a primarily cold atmosphere to it, sometimes branching off into somewhat warmer areas at times. They were all a treat to look at, but I think the area that really stood out from all the rest in this game, or the last one, was the real goal of the adventure, the lost city of Kitesh. Areas in Tomb Raider really stand out when they have a strong color theme to their aesthetic. And for Kitesh, it was this very beautiful but eerie cool blue being in a city buried under an icy mountain. While not as crazy as lava filled flesh caves or floating green islands, the dark chill of this area really sold me on its identity as the final area. One of my favorites, even though what went on in the area wasn't exactly the best. And you know they got me here with the reference to the 2001 movie. When it came down to the lore surrounding the main quest, I'd give CD credit. 
they really go above and beyond with expanding on the topic of the adventure. From the architecture to the accounts of significant figures of the past, there's more than enough covering the lore of the Prophet. Admittedly, I wasn't completely invested in the story of the battle between the two religious groups in ancient history, but there were a few moments where I was genuinely fascinated or at least appalled by some of the ancient accounts. So for combat, more of the same as the previous game just expanded in ways that offered a lot more options. They added a bomb trap mechanic which I never ever used, so if you're like me, you may never even use some of the tools at your disposal, but they're nice to have. My favorite additions were the overpowered arrows of poison which downed man and beast alike faster than any explosive that I had. The power of stink, I guess. Go figure. What I did love was the inclusion of a lot more non-human adversaries in very unsettling places. They felt as formidable as such great beasts would be. The fact that you couldn't even headshot some of the animals just made it even more apparent how ineffectual a single pistol is as opposed to two pistols. What's the hold up? Why can't we have two? Give us two! <laughs> Apparently, they're not in too much of a hurry to add in old combat staples, like increased agility and risky maneuvers. I mean, I'm not really asking for you to do somersaults and cartwheels during a firefight, but give us some more graceful rolls, some fancier melee takedowns, some vertical animal evasion. She's a runner, she's a gymnast, she's a track star. Come on, let's get some creativity. As for the amount of combat in the game, based on the way I carried out my adventure, I'd say it was better paced than it was in the previous game. Enemy encounters during exploration were short and sometimes thoughtful. Most mindless waves of enemies came during the main campaign, where if you're making a beeline to the end, it would definitely seem like a bit heavy on the combat. I still give the game credit for allowing the player to pace their combat intake. But summing up the entire main experience, I still feel like the amount of enemy encounters is still too much, especially when there's so little variety. Like I said, I made things pretty balanced by exploring and finding more exotic beasts on my path. But for the most part, the story once again has Lara's main enemies be different flavors of human henchmen. It gets tiring. I don't know about you guys, but I definitely miss some of the real supernatural weirdness. Give us some more monstrosities, otherworldly beasts, crazy alien looking things, statues that wake up and choose violence. Closest thing to crazy weird is what we get in the Baba Yaga DLC, and even that is mostly just a hallucination. But hell, I'll take that just to add some spice to things. Speaking of the DLC, I did enjoy the slightly different gameplay segment it had, where combat and traversal of the environment was almost simultaneous. Put it in the actual base game next time, please. The game's got good exploration. It's there, it's in the DNA, it's just not the main part, and that is something that I have to take issue with. Exploring your environment is one of the greatest rewards of playing these games. It's what satisfies that craving, finding things in places where you're not supposed to go. It's the separation between exploration and the main campaign that's really hurting the Tomb Raider series these days, at least for me and a lot of classic fans. Inject these things into the main storyline. There's quite a few optional tombs this time around, a lot of them being very interesting locations that I actually had fun looking at for a while. There are also these crypts, which really sold the whole tomb raiding aspect to me. Honestly, I felt like not doing the main campaign was more of a tomb raider experience than doing the main campaign. The exploration just throws you into it, and I spent a good long time figuring out where I was supposed to go. Probably never used a walkthrough, except for that one time where I didn't know you could throw these pumpkins into these damn barrels. So the platforming is much like it was in the previous game. There are indeed additions that I like like the grapple hook axe that Lara gets, finally bringing back the grappling hook from the previous Crystal Dynamics series. This actually added a little bit of freedom because you have the option of either hooking to a ledge manually with your arms or just using the axe to expedite things, which is nice. I feel like the game could serve from more of that. 
I also really enjoyed the climbing arrows, which is a callback to Lara Croft and the Guardian of Light, which is not a bad game to take mechanics from. What I did take issue with with the platforming in this game that really kind of highlights the problem with all these restrictive scripted mobility segments is the whole thing about backtracking. When platforming and climbing, it's not always as simple as just backtracking the way you came. If you jumped to a wall and climbed it to get somewhere, you can't just go back down that wall and jump backwards the same way you came. No, you used to be able to do that in the Legend Trilogy. Now, you probably have to find a rope to slide down or some other alternate way back down because Lara refuses to jump backwards in this game. For some reason, she's not nimble enough to do that. Despite being able to kick upwards on a wall, she can't kick backwards off a wall, which I found really irritating when I was trying to find some optional secrets. I'm ascending this tower, I'd like to come back down the tower without having to go all the way up to find a rope to slide down. I often had to find creative ways to try to get down. I got stuck on this area for a long time just because I wanted to get back down. See this area? This room? To get in here, Lara has to do this crawling animation. And once she does, she's not gonna do the crawling animation back the way she came. Oh no, you have to go all the way around to the end of this area. And at this point, you're probably thinking, I've been here before in this story. Usually, we go through this way, except now this way is blocked. So where do you go? Apparently, you go up here, which is kind of inconspicuous. This is the kind of inconspicuosity if that's even a word, that I would like to put a secret behind. Put a hidden treasure behind this sort of thing. Don't make it so that I have to come all the way here just to find this tiny pathway. I just want to leave. Lara, let me leave. So to sum it up, the platforming, definitely better than the last game. There's swimming now, which, you know, is nice. You can't, like, fully explore the depth of the water, but it it's possible. While not full freedom, it does at least alleviate the problem that a lot of people have with underwater controls in that there's not a lot of up and down to do. You just go forward and use the water to your advantage. Crystal Dynamics knows how to make a decent physics puzzle. I will give them that. They have a good bead on small single area puzzles that require some thought as to the mechanisms that you're using in a very small, confined area. However, what the reboot series is lacking in is wide area puzzles. Puzzles that span an entire hub area. Puzzles that aren't just secluded into one room. Oftentimes in old games you'd have to find keys to other areas, find switches to open other doors, find hidden spaces which would adjust some physics in another area. The puzzle was the entire area and it was all pretty interconnected. In the reboot series, it's all just isolated instances. I can think of at least two areas that had a relatively wide span in the puzzle solving, but again, too few and far between. Puzzles were definitely better than the last game, so points for improving on what they already had. I am so goddamn tired of her telling me what to do. Every time I'm trying to figure out a mechanism and she insists on giving me unsolicited, condescending advice. And all because I needed to highlight the interactable objects in the area. Which I wouldn't have to do so much if Lara would just light her damn glow stick so I could see three feet in front of me. Sometimes I wish she never made it off that island. Tomb Raider has always had some really beautiful and fitting music. Almost every game always has those soundtracks that really get you moving in the heat of the action. Now, I have to say, I haven't been the biggest fan of the music and audio for the reboot games so far. Tomb Raider 2013 didn't have many memorable tracks that stand out to me, and I'm a big fan of both ambient tracks and very upbeat melodic set piece tracks. So the fact that the reboot games really haven't delivered much on either of these areas is a bit of an issue. I mean, it is good on one part that there is a pervading silence in a lot of the areas. Sometimes it's just a bit too quiet, and when it's not being quiet, it's just a bit too cinematic. There are only two standout tracks that I can actually remember from the 2013 reboot which are the track that plays when Lara is ascending the radio tower and the track that plays during the final combat sequence with the waves of enemies. Disappointingly, there aren't many tracks that I heard during my playthrough of Rise that I can even say I remember how they sound. 
I wanted to dedicate this section to the identity of Tomb Raider and Lara in particular, as you might realize that she's the only character I haven't really talked at length about in this review. Now, a lot of my opinions on who Lara is and who Lara can be or should be were covered in a previous video on my channel, and you're free to check that out if you wish. A lot of my sentiments from that video stay the same. Lara is still quite different, and I'm aware that the second installment in the reboot trilogy is simply as it states her rise to being a Tomb Raider. But even at the end, I don't think she's far along enough as to what she should be. One of the key factors she's missing is that elegant grace that she has. Currently, Lara is really physically impressive. She does things that a lot of people will not be able to do, and in some ways she does them more practically than she used to do before. Herein lies the problem. She does in fact lack the grace that shows that, hey, she can do all of these things and she can do them with flair. Lara as a personality, she's lacking a bit of the charisma and sharp tongue that she used to have, which people really loved. That said, just because Lara was a charismatic badass didn't mean that she didn't care about things. Winston, take a look at this. It's almost identical, just configured differently. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I usually didn't do review content for Tomb Raider on this channel, it was mostly just mods, but having not played Rise and hearing about how it was an improvement on the previous game, I had to cover it like this. No matter what problems I had with the game, I still had a lot of fun completing it. Now, I know a lot of people are passionate about their opinions on Tomb Raider, so be sure to leave your arguments, your debates, your complaints, your praises, your memories, your opinions in the comments. Anyway, that's it. Bye.